officially 3.30, and so we will get started. And thank you for those who are joining us in person. Recording in progress. And virtually. Um, so our speaker today is our own Professor Friedon Shubaditsi, who is a member, has been a member of the Thayer School faculty since uh, 2007. Uh, Fridon has authored or co-authored over 50 journal or and 160 conference papers in the area of electromagnetics, which is the subject of his talk today. He's received a number of awards and honors over the years, the most recent being the 2019 Georgian Medal of Honor from his native Republic of Georgia, which received for his personal contribution in the development of science and in the creation of modern technologies. I'm sure some of which we'll hear about today. Yes. Yeah. Please. Um, please let, let them know rough. Professor Shubaditsa. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you for uh, introduction and thank you for coming um, to listen to my talk uh, per in person and in virtually um, as well. Uh, let me start uh, saying that uh, today actually is. 22 years uh, uh, since I first time entered in this great institution. I arrived here as a postdoc or research uh, associate back uh, January 21, 2000. And I have been here 22 years <clears throat> and uh, in this great community uh, and had opportunity working with uh, uh, great students uh, uh, faculty members uh, and staff uh, as well. So uh, by saying this, uh, uh, let me start uh, uh, talking about what uh, I had done in electromagnetics before coming here uh, at Taylor School. Uh, and my first research back in my home country of Georgia, uh, Republic of Georgia, <clears throat> was uh, I studied electrostatic discharge uh, problem, um, uh, which is a non-linear electromagnetic, uh, uh, ele electromagnetic uh, scattering and radiation problem. And those arises um, uh, inside uh, uh, for, uh, cars or anywhere in electronics. And what is a problem when this electrostatic uh, uh, discharge happens, there is a very strong electromagnetic fields are radiated and those electromagnetic fields can destroy electronics. Uh, once I left the country, my colleagues continue working on this direction and they developed this uh, software package called EMCOS and we here at Tayer, we have full license and I use quite a bit in my uh, electromagnetic class uh, just to show students uh, field distributions uh, uh, as well as a uh, like model real electromagnetic uh, uh, problems. From Georgia, uh, I, I moved to Greece and I spent time there uh, um, uh, one year and the problem uh, I was solving there was uh, related to this mic conformal microstrip antennas, uh, just to take these small antennas and put this uh, cylindrical shape. Uh, and my goal there was to develop a numerical technique that allowed us to fully understand behavior of such kind of systems and then to fabricate. Uh, in addition uh, to this work, I also was involved uh, in uh, uh, microwave uh, hyperthermia um, uh, problem uh, as well as a uh, study human head cell phone interaction using uh, uh, numerical uh, techniques. So again, going back in Greece, uh, when we left Greece, it was plus 23 Celsius. And when we arrived here was minus 23 Celsius, which was very, very shocking. <laughs> so, what I do here at uh, Tayer, uh, uh, in my research program, um, I uh, divide into parts, uh, into parts. Uh, and again, I continue doing electromagnetics, but in different applications. One is uh, geophysical applications. Um, we are uh, Research is uh, concentrated on the developing detection and classification technology for finding unexploded ordinances. 
Uh, second is a problem, uh, program uh, or project there is a, to use uh, sensing technology uh, for finding improvised explosive devices. And then third one is for detecting and mapping subsurface infrastructures, such as pipes, wires, tunnels, and uh, other kind of uh, um, uh, structures underground. And then second uh, applications are built by, med by medical applications. I continue working on the hyperthermia uh, uh, and uh, switch from the microwave hyperthermia to magnetic nanoparticle hyperthermia for cancer uh, treatment. Uh, recently, he working with my colleagues to combine this magnetic nanoparticle hyperthermia with phage uh, therapy. Uh, and then working on uh, DNA sequencing. So uh, as you see, this is a quite uh, broad and then I will try to fit uh, in this one hour uh, uh, here um, uh, and give you lots of information. Mostly it will be uh, historical and then some key points that uh, we achieved during this uh, uh, time of period. And I will start uh, my uh, talk uh, on the geophysical uh, application and start from uh, UXO. So what is the UXO problem uh, and then how it started at Taylor School? So in 90, uh, 1990, Congress established this uh, uh, program, Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program to address DOD's environmental issues. And that is right after the Cold War ended, uh, and then U.S. military de decided to turn lands, uh, former military ranges, to the public. But doing that, they uh, were not allowed unless they will declare those sites are clear. clear. And then one of these uh, uh, problems that the uh, Army uh, and DOD particularly faced at that time was this uh, UXO problem. Uh, there are lots of uh, UXOs, as we will see here later. And then later 90s, Dr. Kevin O'Neill, who, who was uh, at Krell, he stopped and then he, uh, was, uh, and still is, now adjunct professor here at Taylor School. He uh, originated this as joint Krell Taylor research direction on UXO. And then Kevin uh, actually invited me to help him uh, and work for him uh, to solve this low-frequency uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, induction problem. So if you look at this, uh, what is a UXO problem in the United States, as I said, it is uh, Army's number one environmental problem. If you take, uh, and that's the uh, estimates which uh, Congress put back in 2004, uh, they say that approximately 11 million acres of land, uh, land are infected with UXOs. If you take in perspective, this is approximately if you will combine New Hampshire and Vermont together. In addition, recently a uh, report came out and then pointed out that there are 10 million underwater areas also are contaminated with UXOs. Uh, <clears throat> And then UXOs are a problem not only in the United States, it's a problem all around the world. Like uh, European countries have UXOs, and then you can see in news almost uh, uh, every month uh, in European countries that they will discover unexploded ordinances. Under uh, runways uh, at the airport, you will be surprised uh, uh, on uh, highways, uh, under buildings, and then when they will start digging or building new uh, uh, buildings, uh, they have to clear before even start uh, uh, doing work there. Of course, we had uh, former Soviet Union countries have lots of UXO because of the training. Uh, and then another uh, uh, area uh, on the world is uh, Southeast Asia countries where by estimate uh, they uh, was dropped uh, 270 million bombs uh, during this uh, time period. And then they found that uh, 80 million out of this uh, 270 did not explode as intended. So those are particularly these cluster bombs which are scattered all around and then still is a problem 
uh, in, in the, the countries. Uh, so when we look at uh, subsurface target detection uh, uh, using different technologies, uh, 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 we can divide this uh, into three categories. One is a, a, a magnetometers and electromagnetic induction, and those technologies are good for detecting metals. Magnetometers, as you know, they detect disturbance of uh, magnet, uh, Earth's magnetic field. Those are passive sensors, whereas electromagnetic induction is an active, uh, active sensor for detecting metals. Uh, magnetometers can detect only ferrous targets, whereas uh, electromagnetic induction detects uh, ferrous as well as uh, non-ferrous targets. Then comes ground penetrating radars, which detects metals as well as a dielectric. And then uh, we have trained animals uh, and nuclear detections, uh, which basically detects uh, explosive uh, and compound. If you look which technology succeed in real practice, uh, most uh, used are magnetometers and electromagnetic induction. Ground penetrating radar are mostly experimental and there are some small scale service for finding those, uh, this type of targets. As we know, ground penetrating radars are good for inspecting roadways, uh, pavements, and other parts, but for the, uh, we're talking about finding this uh, uh, small uh, targets. Trained animals are also used uh, for find uh, explosive, and then nuclear detection is still in lab settings, lab settings uh, uh, at this moment. No, uh, now, if you take a standard metal detectors uh, for applying for uh, uh, unexploded ordnance detection and uh, discrimination, uh, it has a challenge. Challenge is that most, if not all UXOs, are uh, made with metals or containing substantial amount of metals. Therefore, with metal detectors, you can detect them. But those metal detectors did not provide us ability to distinguish which one is uh, unexploded and which one is an exploded uh, piece of clutter. And then in practice, actually in the beginning of 90s when Army declared this environmental problem, they even said that let's go and then dig all anomalies that will be detected with uh, metal detectors. And this is a flag here when they used metal detectors. This is a uh, here, metal detector, uh, magnetometer, basically. And all these flags are a detected anomaly. And they ended up that finding one UXO, they had to dig uh, thousands and tens of thousands uh, targets. Therefore, it was very expensive. And then cleanup cost estimated uh, was tens of billions of dollars. Uh, and then finally, uh, everybody understood that we needed uh, to come up with a classification technology to develop the systems that allowed us to d detect as well as uh, to classify uh, targets. Now, if you look with UXO classification from the big uh, uh, picture, we can divide this into three subsequential steps. First is uh, we need to have a data uh, then we had to have good enough data to support this forward and inverse models to extract some parameters. And then final step is uh, classification. So as I said, it is a sequential step. And then at every step, we need high fidelity uh, data model and then finally classification parameters in order to achieve a uh, goal. So as I, uh, our group uh, um, uh, back beginning of 2000 um, looked different technologies. We looked uh, and had projects looking ground penetrating radars. We had project for developing electromagnetic induction sensing, uh, as well as a, a community, uh, entire community of UXO community. We are looking different technologies and then we came together um, and uh, concluded that the best way to solve this problem was uh, electromagnetic induction sensing. Let me explain now what is the electromagnetic induction sensing. 
When we say electromagnetic induction, we mean the frequency range from tens hertz up to tens of kilohertz. So if you look this this uh, frequency range, wavelength is uh, kilometers, hundreds of kilometers uh, length, uh, size. Why we need this? Because targets are inside soil, uh, and uh, soil for the uh, radars or high frequencies is a problem. You cannot get signal inside. So what happens in this frequency range, we have this transmitter which produces this magnetic field. This mag uh, magnetic uh, and plus uh, electric field, this electromagnetic field then penetrates inside these metallic targets, even though conductivity is very high, but we have low frequency and therefore signals can still penetrate inside object. It induces this eddy currents, and this eddy current then produces secondary field where we have to put the receivers, and then based on the received signals, we have to extract targets, parameters for the classification. So to achieve this and then come up with a good scheme, we had to solve this problem. And as I said, that was like uh, my first task here, uh, arriving to solve electromagnetic induction problem. Uh, and then um, to solve this, I brought this uh, method of auxiliary sources, which uh, basis of this method, mathematical, was developed again back in my country, as well as uh, it was implemented, uh, and I had experience for solving uh, wave phenomena. So when we so talk about induction, it's a diffusion uh, phenomena, not electromagnetic wave phenomena. So uh, this, uh, uh, I... After arriving, I adapted this technology for solving this uh, low-frequency electromagnetic induction problem. This method is a semi-analytical uh, technique. Basically, by definition, it satisfies all equations. And then when we are solving problems, uh, this uh, electromagnetic problems for a given targets, we set uh, up two sets of auxiliary sources. The sources that we place outside, we use them to describe field, fields inside object, and then we have another set of sources that we put inside um, from this boundary, and those sources define field outside the object. Only part what's left here is the magnitude of these uh, auxiliary sources, which we obtained by solving this linear system of uh, equations. Again, it is very simple um, to implement. And indeed, uh, after uh, arriving here, I was able to adapt this for hyperthermia as well as uh, for the uh, optical frequencies as well to, to uh, study uh, total internal reflection, uh, for, for example. And then in terms of wavelengths, it spans uh, from nanoscale uh, to the, uh, like, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, thousands of uh, uh, kilometers uh, here. So once uh, uh, this uh, method was developed, but, uh, at that time we had this standard metal detectors and then accuracy was checked. We had high confidence that it was working. And then next step, uh, uh, and our goal was to come up with new set of uh, sensors that allowed us uh, uh, to detect and classify targets. And it was clear evidence that in order to uh, find, uh, to extract tar targets intrinsic as, as well as the extrinsic parameters such as location, orientation, we had to come up with a system that will have multiple transmitters and multiple receivers. This, uh, uh, the metal detectors uh, I demonstrated before, all of them, um, almost all of them were working in frequency domain, meaning continuous wave. And then when you have a continuous wave transmitter configuration, it was limited. It was, there was no way we, we are able to have multiple transmitter receiver in frequency domain. And again, entire UXO community came to the conclusion that uh, for our goal, it was important to switch or develop systems uh, in time domain. So what time domain systems uh, does for us? Again, we have same coils, but instead now uh, putting these continuous waves, we have transient currents. 
In transient currents, we have time period when we uh, turn on uh, and hold this uh, approximately uh, between 10 uh, milli uh, to 25 millisecond, and then we turn off, and then when turn off, we put a receiver here and uh, listening. And do, by doing this, we, uh, it's allowed us to avoid primary field, which uh, could saturate your uh, re receivers. And uh, uh, that's allowed, uh, by switching uh, this part, allowed us to uh, put as many transmitter uh, and as many receivers as we needed uh, to support the classification. So as a first development, then comes this uh, uh, next generation EMI sensors. One of the first was metal detector, which had uh, three transmitters. Uh, uh, these big coils here are transmitters, and it had seven uh, receiver tubes collecting vector field, not only just a one scalar field, but vector field uh, to support uh, uh, classification. And then at the time, uh, our team, we designed, and then company uh, GNG uh, uh, built it for us, this first uh, handheld time domain system, which had uh, uh, this uh, uh, transmitter, one transmitter and five uh, uh, receiver cube, using same uh, technology what uh, uh, was done for the metal mapper. But that system was uh, a little bit smaller um, uh, sm smaller, uh, and, and then uh, we call this not handheld, we basically call the man portable uh, vector uh, system because it uh, really was big uh, and very heavy. So we needed very strong men uh, to, to move uh, uh, or person uh, to move. Since that, there came uh, like uh, lots of advanced EMI sensors. All of them has a multiple transmitter, multiple receivers. Um, and uh, there is now MPV second generation time domain system here, and then recently our group also come up with a new design we call the ultra light uh, electromagnetic array uh, system, which has four transmitters and uh, four uh, uh, cubic uh, receivers. Uh, so that's a, a still under uh, development. So now, once we had the good uh, systems, the next uh, step was coming uh, to have data inversion. So to come up with a good scheme that uh, allowed us to take all this data, this new system, very rich data sets, and try to extract uh, parameters. So here comes this uh, modeling uh, again to model forward and inverse uh, uh, problem, and then uh, again, beginning of uh, entire project and uh, before that even, it was known that uh, this is a dipole model, uh, known as a dipole model, uh, and it's simple. Uh, An idea here is that if we have a even elongated targets, we can replace this target with a magnetic dipole, just a simple uh, magnetic dipole placing at the center. And then when we have this primary field, what primary field uh, does, it scales the magnitude of this uh, dipole, uh, magnetic dipole. And then the magnetic dipole moment uh, is related to, with this constant, which is a property of the object. This is a actually intrinsic uh, target parameters, and that is our uh, classification feature. That's what we found to be used for our classification. We are not looking images, we are looking ways to extract these parameters and to do then uh, based on this one uh, classification. As I said, there was this uh, dipole model and then many targets uh, uh, were elongated. There are noise uh, always when you are in a real field. And in order to extract uh, target signal very carefully, we had to come up with a new scheme as well. And our group developed this uh, orthonormalized volume magnetic source model. The idea here is, uh, um, again, to have a set of magnetic dipoles distributed in a space, and then each dipole um, will be interacting uh, between each other, and we form a orthogonal functions. 
And those uh, orthogonal functions we use to represent secondary field. It is like a, when you have a very noisy signal, you want to have a Fourier transform to extract correct modes. If you know what you are looking, basically you apply this orthogonality to extract uh, those uh, parameters. So we did this uh, uh, orthonormalization by placing those dipoles, allowing them to uh, uh, do process and build this theoretical or numerical and, and then once we had, we could represent magnetic field. Now, if you take simple dipole model approach here, the total field then is represented as a sum of the field produced from each individual dipole. What happens then in this approach at the end, this field we had to uh, match to the measured data and it could be uh, 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 forced uh, just to solve this linear system of equations and depending how many objects on what type of data you may have, uh, this uh, could be underdetermined system. Uh, therefore, there was a, a chance that those dipoles were not real representative of the target. We are else, in our case, as I said, we are uh, extracting those parameters without solving linear system of equation. Basically, we are doing orthonormalization, orthogonality of those functions, and by doing that, we could extract uh, a clear uh, target signal more carefully, uh, and, and then uh, use those ones uh, uh, as an effective polarizability for uh, classification. Okay, now once we had and achieved sensors, we had models, then uh, again, nobody will believe unless you will go and do real uh, testing, right? And uh, this program said that ESTCP, and ESTCP uh, means uh, Environmental Security Technology uh, Certified Program, which was another organization uh, put together with CERDEP. Basically, they are looking more applied once CERDEP uh, is a program that funds basic research, and if something comes good, then moves uh, to this program to see uh, that, that technology could make uh, uh, into commercialization. So they set it up uh, this uh, blind test, and one of the first blind tests was at Camp Butner, North Carolina. That uh, was in 2009, 2010. They choose area, uh, and then that's a live uh, UXO site. Um, they collected this data, uh, and then using two instruments, one is a EM61, uh, that's a, again, uh, a, a standard metal detector, and then this new advanced system, uh, metal mapper, um, and then from detected signals without processing, just uh, using threshold, they identified uh, approximately 2,500 anomalies for intrusive investigation. So that means that they send uh, groups there, they dug these targets, and they had actual ground truths. Ground truths meaning targets orientation as well as their location, depths, and all the information what they could uh, extract. So once they had this target, then uh, they, uh, they did uh, ask another team to deploy systems in queued mode. And queued mode means uh, static mode. So basically, you know GPS location of the targets. You take sensor, put about targets, and collect data. And by stacking, you could improve signal to noise ratio. So we received these data sets um, uh, and um, extracted the parameters. That's uh, what we call the polarizability or effective uh, polarizabilities for targets classification. So we did not know what type of targets we are uh, on, on the site. Uh, we were just given data. Uh, it was totally blind to us. And uh, we processed data and extracted these uh, uh, effective polarizabilities. And at the end, we said all of these targets are this uh, 105 millimeter projectile. Uh, this is called hit around 105 millimeters. And here are lots of uh, uh, curves, and those we are extracting from, uh, from different positions. 
So on this side, there were several uh, 105s uh, or any other uh, targets here, what you see. And then we use data, we extract it, and you can see that those extracted polarizabilities are very well constrained. They are clustered and uh, shows this uh, property of this object. If you look a polarizability for this 105, which has different shapes than uh, this uh, 105, you can distinguish them by uh, the decay, so characteristics. Another part is that we have the three colors here. Uh, this uh, uh, blue one corresponds to the primary polarizabilities. That's a polarizability along axis of sy symmetry. And then green and uh, red uh, curves correspond to the uh, uh, secondary and tertiary polarizabilities. Those are uh, perpendicular uh, to, to this uh, um, uh, axis of symmetry. Uh, and, by do, uh, and then for the comparisons here, if we had the clutter, uh, you can distinguish clearly. For example, horseshoe, which was found there, you can see those polarizabilities are not uh, as well like a, uh, particularly secondary and tertiary. They are not matching uh, uh, to each other. So those were features that we use for classification. Uh, and, and then, uh, Results, we, once we classified, we submitted our dig list. Uh, we identified targets that needed to be dug and uh, targets that needed to remain close. Uh, we call the target uh, clutter. Uh, and then this is an independently scored result that we received. And here are lots of information. So on, on this axis, we have number of uh, TOI digs uh, on X axis. On y-axis, we have number of uh, TOI digs, and TOI means target of interest. Um, so going up means that uh, we said, we, we thought that this is a target, is a target of interest, and it was correct. Going right uh, means that we said this is a target of interest, uh, and it turns out it's we clutter, so, or false uh, positive in this case. By, like if you look this one, it, we achieved almost perfect uh, ROC curve. Uh, we say that to stop dig at this point, um, and this is a point we are 95% of TOIs we are dug. Uh, at this point, turning point, uh, we had all TOIs and had, we had extra uh, digs to make sure that uh, our analysis was correct. So, we are able to distinguish targets not only as a target of interest, but by type. Like we could uh, identify one of five compared to the 37 millimeters and uh, compared to the other target as well. So once this results was delivered, our program said that problem is solved. And basically said the program stopped funding all basic research on uh, EUXO on this area. However, there was another program which was uh, this ESTCP and they wanted, once technology was ready, they said we need to fully understand what is this technology capability and how we can use in real practice. And they set it up uh, all around the country, lots of uh, life side UXO study programs um, and our team uh, 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 took uh, part uh, on uh, 20 live UX sites. All the stars are where places are. And one of these is uh, New Boston, which is uh, close to the Manchester airport. And they do have their UXOs uh, as well, as well as the Massachusetts Military Reservation, which is in a Cape Cod. Its site also is uh, highly contaminated uh, with UXOs. So, we, uh, when we deploy this technology, we achieved uh, uh, almost same results uh, what I ha have shown uh, uh, simi or similar results uh, for Camp Butner on, on all of these sites. Uh, and here are some uh, very difficult sites. Uh, uh, one was in Texas, another is a Fort Ord. Uh, it's a nice uh, piece uh, there in Monterey, California, uh, near, uh, and it's a uh, uh, highly contaminated uh, with uh, UXO. So then you could ask question, what is the difference? Why our team uh, and how well 
we do compared to our other team. So on this uh, simple sites, uh, those are comparable uh, results uh, we can obtain. But when we have a uh, like highly contaminated and the difficult sites, our team still was uh, able to achieve uh, very high uh, 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 classification results, whereas other teams still had difficulties to obtain all UXOs. And then on this program, uh, when you see this uh, rock curve, um, it's not like um, our sponsor wants to look what is the area under rock curve. They want to see that uh, analysts should achieve this 100% of detection and classification of potential UXOs. So by uh, understanding more and more uh, about this uh, technology, um, as I indicated from the beginning, uh, the way it was implemented was as following. So we take this advanced EMI sensors, we uh, take in a queued mode. Queued mode is at like continuously collecting data, not non-stopping. And then uh, they have analysts, they go and uh, find this uh, detection, uh, figure out what uh, those targets uh, or pick these anomalies. And then they said, go back now and collect uh, the data in queued mode. So that's a very time consuming. If you consider it's a very slow process and it's uh, basically it's a uh, 1.5 minute per anomaly. And now if you multiply this uh, 11 million acres of land and for each acre approximately 400, 500 targets, you will end up, uh, it will take for one sensor centuries to clean up or detect these uh, uh, anomalies. So after, uh, uh, and then just for the illustration, what is a different here is a, uh, I made this movie, uh, if you have a target and then sensor is moving here, this is a transmitted field and uh, this red arrows is a induced uh, dipole, magnetic dipole inside targets. And you see how it uh, follows this target. And here are uh, received signals or secondary signals uh, from, from all this target. It's very fast, you are mo moving, walking and collect and cover a big area. Where else? Here is a queued mode, and in queued mode, uh, again, we meant we take sensor parked uh, about above the targets and then fire these transmitter receivers in many, many cases and stack those data. Uh, so we thought how we can uh, uh, gain and use, utilize uh, this uh, advanced EMI models as well as uh, this advanced uh, uh, EMI uh, uh, signal processing approach. So we, we decided to uh, go straight and then uh, process a dynamic data set. So dynamic means that uh, when system moves, it fires all transmitters and collects uh, data in all receivers. And one date dynamic point is that when we have this complete uh, data sets for, uh, for all transmitters and for receivers. So we took this data and then um, uh, processed independently, point to point. And once we processed this data, then we took uh, a location of the targets um, uh, uh, as well as a position and then matched those in global positioning system uh, using GP GPS. So what you see here, uh, this is an extracted uh, uh, location when sensor was placed here, here, and as well as going close to targets, all inverted location uh, clusters around the target. So then we realized that for each point, we can extract polarizabilities as well, very well. Uh, as you say, see here is a, a polarizabilities in library. Um, and then those um, uh, 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 black, uh, blue, and um, uh, green, uh, uh, green li uh, lines here are extracted polarizability from these uh, points. So going back to Q1, Q2, we put sensor and we had to fire several times and stack them in the data space. Now what we understood that by doing this, we can uh, take all polarizabilities 
Uh, and then if you plot, they have uh, like uh, sparse, they are scattered all around. But again, apply same technology to the uh, same approach to arrange those data, but not in data space, uh, but in a, <clears throat> in a polarizability space. We, we are able to extract uh, very robust polarizabilities. So it gives us close to what uh, we have seen when sensor was deployed in uh, queued mode, uh, which is a time, uh, time consuming. So after seeing this one, uh, we moved forward and uh, uh, now are, uh, there are systems that uh, uh, uses uh, one pass, we call it one pass, we, uh, and avoids all the queued data interrogation. Just use uh, process the dynamic data sets and extract targets parameters. So where are we going now for, for, uh, for our self our group uh, as a next step. Uh, this uh, approach, uh, we, as we understood more and more, we decided uh, and we are supported from the Air Force uh, program to take EMI systems and put on drones. Uh, and then take data and process and extract these uh, polarizabilities. Here is a test that was done uh, in uh, Florida uh, 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 last um, uh, September, and here are some uh, extracted uh, uh, polarizabilities. Uh, and on this project, uh, uh, I have two grad students, Michelle, who is here, and Max, uh, both of them. And uh, Michelle is taking uh, uh, on this uh, system design uh, as well as a uh, uh, targets to use this uh, um, uh, algorithm to extract polarizabilities. Um, uh, and Max will be working uh, on uh, adapting sensors and make, uh, make them more controllable uh, in the future. Um, and what you have seen here also, um, uh, let me point out that in this case, you see primary polarizability matches very well with expected library targets. Whereas secondary tertiary polarizability, they don't. Uh, and that's the case because our drone system here, it had only Z receivers. So in order to achieve uh, better secondary tertiary polarizabilities, we, we have to include uh, uh, X and Y receivers. And that's what they are designing and building uh, uh, right now. Another program uh, recently, he, uh, uh, we, we are start working is that to take this uh, uh, system uh, and then put on the uh, unmanned uh, ground systems just as uh, robots. Again, this uh, is a Max uh, uh, program here, um, and he is designing uh, and making this system ready uh, to use and test uh, sometime soon uh, uh, in uh, in Florida. Um, uh, so. <clears throat> Uh, here again, this uh, project is uh, for uh, uh, Navy, and they want to clean a large area. The idea there is that uh, uh, when uh, enemies will bomb some airports, they need to repair uh, very fast uh, um, traditional uh, airport uh, as well as the uh, airports or airfields, uh, I would say, in a remote uh, uh, area. So that's, that's why they are looking this uh, best way uh, or fast way to, to or clean up these uh, areas. So what we have seen up to this point uh, mostly are uh, uh, on this uh, metal, uh, metallic object. Uh, but another program that we also implemented here <coughs> uh, uh, was to find uh, non-metallic uh, targets uh, as well. So again, on UXOs, uh, we can use this traditional uh, or advanced EMI sensors, uh, but there are uh, nowadays uh, materials uh, such as carbon fiber, depleted uranium, that are not as conductive as metallic objects. And those type of materials uh, are used uh, in ID, improvised explosive devices, as a, a triggering mechanism, uh, and it's very hard to detect with metal detectors. Army is also putting these uh, uh, smart bombs, which will be made with a carbon, uh, carbon fiber 
um, and uh, they need the technology to find uh, this, uh, this uh, type of uh, UXOs on ranges when they will start uh, um, using for exercise, as well as there are non-metallic uh, materials. And to address uh, this problem, uh, and those problem was, uh, uh, was asked us uh, to find a solution, Again, we take this model and run for different conductivities and immediately from numerical modeling perspective, we understood that uh, in order to detect those type of materials, we needed to uh, put the frequency towards to high frequency. And here comes uh, uh, development of these uh, high frequency EMI sensors. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, this sensor's uh, development was uh, supported uh, uh, and has been supported by ONR. <clears throat> and we had some first demonstrations, 2019, um, uh, and we were able to find those ID targets. Uh, but at the time, our first generation sensor as a data acquisition, we use a picoscope technology, which was very slow. Uh, slow. Uh, it takes time, uh, and uh, now, uh, we are working on the project to uh, extend uh, and uh, put this uh, FPGA-based boards uh, to achieve real-time uh, detection as well as the ending on classification. And then my grad student, Kaylin Harsron, who is here also, uh, is going to uh, uh, update this system and implement this uh, um, uh, new high-frequency EMI for finding um, uh, those targets. Uh, another uh, project uh, uh, we are currently working are uh, uh, also this uh, uh, finding underground utilities. Uh, if you look this map, uh, in the United States there is approximately 25 million miles of uh, pipes. Uh, those get old, they need to assess their conditions as well as uh, there are no historical maps uh, and they have to find before uh, building uh, new roads or uh, uh, other, uh, other parts. So uh, we had support from um, and have support from ARPAE uh, on this and here uh, we are pursuing a new linear current so, uh, source uh, sensing technologies uh, for finding this elongated, uh, uh, elongated target. And then idea here is that we use again uh, this magnetic dipole or a coil, uh, and instead of using magnetic field, we use electric field, which couples uh, along this uh, uh, target, uh, uh, along target here, and then instead of uh, looking then at the current, which is a case for induction, now we are looking this uh, uh, linear current along wire, which then produces magnetic field and we can sense. By doing this, it's uh, increased our detection range and we are able uh, to detect wires quite deep, up to maybe 10, uh, 10 meters in, in some cases. Um, uh, and here is a, a system uh, that's, um, uh, uh, again, my uh, uh, grad students, uh, Sven uh, and Kaylin are working. Sven is mostly concentrated uh, on, on the software part of signal processing and understanding uh, better uh, to, to make a better sensing systems, uh, whereas Kellen is uh, on, on the uh, hardware part. Uh, and uh, they were able to collect data using this uh, uh, system, uh, and here are some uh, wires placed, and they were all this uh, hot spot here, along those lines are uh, detection. and. Uh, we use this uh, um, uh, transmitter. Uh, finally, here on the, uh, on the geophysical side, we have also a project uh, called iFrost Mapper. Uh, as weather changes, uh, particularly in north part in Alaska, there are lots of permafrost, uh, and permafrost are ice lenses uh, that are inside ground. As it gets uh, warmed up, uh, they are moving and they can destroy roads, uh, buildings, and other parts. So therefore, there are need for the new chip technology to fast deploy and get uh, uh, to map uh, those permafrost. Uh, and then our team are uh, developing, uh, the, again, drone-based uh, 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 electromagnetic induction system 
uh, which is, uh, will be operating uh, uh, from a few kilohertz up to few megahertz uh, frequency range. And then uh, grad student uh, Michelle Maxon is uh, leading this uh, effort on uh, system design as well, uh, as well as a signal processing part. Just briefly now, uh, talk about biomedical application. Uh, I think I'm running out. Uh, so here we use high frequency uh, EMI uh, to do DNA sequencing, uh, basically uh, using fluorescence uh, as well as the total internal reflection. And here are some uh, microscope uh, um, images uh, as a uh, DNA or uh, DNA uh, that is attached to this bead as the distance changes, its uh, fluorescence signal intensity changes. And then we use this uh, uh, basically uh, to uh, map uh, if uh, 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 and read, read out uh, basic DNA basis. Uh, another part on the medical application is a nanoparticle hyperthermia. Uh, here, um, uh, our group, uh, again, used numerical methods to come up with a good uh, uh, sense of what type of nanoparticles we needed to uh, develop for, to achieve high uh, absorption rate uh, or transfer electromagnetic energy into heat, um, uh, as well as uh, we, develop, uh, uh, mag uh, we develop the magnetic field guiding system to further localize uh, uh, magnetic field and avoid eddy currents in, in, uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, normal, uh, normal tissue. Uh, and then here are who's working on this, uh, doing simulation. Our group has a full uh, year, uh, model of virtual human model. We have high resolution. We know uh, pixel to pixel uh, property, electromagnetic as well as a dielectric, uh, electromagnetic as well as a thermal. Uh, property of each cell, and then we use this uh, simulation to, to combine uh, and uh, uh, come up with a better design of coil, uh, and then guide magnetic field, particularly at deep seated uh, tumors. And then finally, we are combining this nano hyperthermia uh, and phage therapy for um, uh, uh, nano particles. Well, that was lots of information, and I could not achieve this without support of uh, my family he, uh, here. My wife, uh, she not only contributed some of the research that uh, was presented, uh, she also uh, kept, kept us uh, uh, at home and then guide uh, and uh, uh, give us uh, um, uh, all the support that uh, I needed as well as the kids. And here are my children. Uh, and thanks to them also for supporting, even though sometimes I left them at bus station or at school uh, and forgetting uh, about them, but still uh, they are with me, so it's good. Another technology I would like to make particularly for Dr. Benjamin Barrows, who is adjunct professor here at Taylor School. Uh, me, like a beginning, uh, and Taylor community knows me, uh, most likely as a person who does and also computation. Uh, and actually, he then joined us uh, in 2007, and uh, from 2011, 2012, we started also uh, build uh, up here hardware parts uh, on our research, uh, and then mostly Ben led this uh, effort, and uh, we are working very, very, very closely uh, on, on this part. So uh, again, during this time, I would like also to acknowledge my uh, electromagnetic physics group members. Uh, uh, we had uh, postdocs, uh, uh, current students, visiting scholars, uh, and then many, many undergrads that come in our lab and uh, uh, did some work for, 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 for us. Uh, and then I had external and internal collaborators. Uh, I worked almost with uh, uh, many uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, faculty members here uh, at their school uh, supported um, uh, and uh, they contributed uh, in my research uh, uh, as well. And then finally, I would like to uh, um, uh, acknowledge my sponsors without uh, their support and trust in our uh, uh, efforts, none of this work could, could happen. Um, and with that, uh, thank you, and I am ready to answer your questions.